Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Welcome back to my plausibility review of S.M. Sterling's infamous book series about a South African slaveocracy that wants to conquer the world. First, a note on pronunciations. When referring to said slaveocracy, I've been saying Draca. Johnny Pez, author of the Drowned Baby Timeline, one of my favorite online alternate histories, however, commented on my last video that the pronunciation should be Draca, since the country was named after Sir Francis Drake, which is also something I forgot to mention in the last episode. Since we all know I'm bad at saying words, and I couldn't find an official source for the pronunciation, I can't think of any reason why Pez is wrong. So going forward, I'll be saying Draca, not Draca. Now back to the alternate history. We last left the Draca right when World War I begins, which plays out much like you would expect. But the Draca do conquer all the Middle East, Bulgaria, and even Central Asia after Russia falls to the Communist. The Draca, however, refuse to give up their conquests when peace is made and declare independence in 1919, changing the name officially to the domination of the Draca. Britain does nothing to stop this, which isn't surprising because they've treated Draca like they weren't a colony of theirs in the first place. But it is surprising that no one else bats an eye at the Draca gaining control of the entire Middle Eastern oil reserves. I mean, it's the 21st century, and we're still fighting over that oil. I just don't find it believable at all that the rest of the world will be okay with the Draca having a monopoly over it. Well, whatever. Let's move on. Now independent, the Draca continue to conquer the world when no one is looking. Before World War II, or the Eurasian Wars as they're known in the books, Afghanistan is pacified or 60% of the population is killed off, and they even invade Italy in 1941, with tacit approval from Nazi Germany. First off, in the books, the Nazis still come to power and are led by Hitler, which is a pretty crazy coincidence. In Sterling's defense, he does say it's only an analog of Hitler and not the exact same person, but they still have the same name, so why not change that if they aren't the same person? Second off, it's unbelievable that Germany would let an aggressively hostile power like the Draca just invade Italy for no reason. You can't even argue they would be busy fighting the Soviets because the Germans did a lot better in this timeline, capturing Moscow in 1941, due to the Soviets having to keep a lot of their armies on the southern border in case the Draca invaded. In fact, if this history tells us anything, the Draca were just waiting for an opportunity to invade so the Germans giving them another avenue like Italy is mind-boggling. Anywho, the Draca do invade Germany by attacking across the Caucasus Peninsula, which is where marching through Georgia begins. Hey everyone, look! I finally got to one of the settings of the books! What happens next can best be described as what would happen if a wheelchair-bound five-year-old decided to pick a fight with Brock Lesnar. The Draca overwhelm the Germans thanks to their advanced technology, which for some reason mirrors American military technology of the late 20th century, and for an even more baffling reason, the German technology is still stuck at what they had in our timeline in the 1940s. Even neutral nations like Spain, Switzerland, and Sweden are overwhelmed. The United States, distracted by their own war with the superpower Japan, who had long since conquered China in this timeline and thus could throw their entire military might at America, is unable to stop them. Nevertheless, it is odd that the United States still does nothing when the Drake are going to invade the rump Soviet Union, which should technically still be an ally of theirs in this timeline, but don't worry. The final war between the Draca and America is coming eventually. The Eurasian War does come to an end thanks to a liberal use of nuclear weapons by the Draca on both the last European holdouts and the Americans on the Japanese. According to the books, the Draca obtained nuclear weapons the same year America did, which is perplexing considering it's mentioned multiple times in the books how far behind the Draca are in comparison to the Americans in most scientific fields, but if I keep harping on these lucky breaks, I'm never going to finish this plausibility review. What begins next is a Cold War-esque conflict called the Protracted Struggle that is covered in Under the Yoke and the Stone Dogs. On one side is the Draca, and the other side is the American-led Alliance for Democracy, a military alliance turned federation made up of other mega-states like the Empire of Brazil, because the United States and the Draca weren't the only countries that consolidated. Technology continues to progress at such a rapid rate that the series has become pure sci-fi at this point, with both the Draca and the Alliance having multiple colonies throughout the solar system and fleets of nuclear-powered spaceships. The Draca, meanwhile, evolved into a super North Korea, isolated from the rest of the world and relying on harsh tactics, including nuking rebellious cities, to maintain order among their serfs. During this period, the Draca began to fall behind the Alliance in most technologies, although why this only started now when they were generations ahead of everyone else in the 1940s is anyone's guess. They still, however, lead the world in genetic engineering and other biological sciences, presumably because they have no scruples about experimenting on humans. They even develop a whole new breed of soldier by combining baboon, human, and a variety of other animal DNA because of course they did. More importantly, Draca scientists developed the Stone Dogs virus and covertly infect much of the Alliance leadership with it. Should World War III ever break out, the virus can be activated by the Draca, which would turn the Alliance leadership into the affected from 20 days later. Meanwhile, the Alliance develops a computer virus that will sabotage Draca nuclear weapons and spaceships in the event of war. That said, nothing really of note happens during the protracted struggle, except at one point India secedes from the Alliance, which is incredibly silly considering Draca's history of conquering isolated states. In the book, it's explained that India learned that the Alliance intelligence had interfered in one of their recent elections, which prompted them to leave. But that doesn't explain the complete stupidity of thinking they could take the Draca on their own. 
Granted, at least the Indians actually did something when they found out someone had interfered with their elections. Turns out, however, that even the whole alliance couldn't survive the Draco. When the secrecy of the Stone Dogs virus is about to be revealed, the Draco launch a preemptive strike in 1998. Much of the Alliance leadership becomes violently insane, thus leaving the Alliance military unable to coordinate a defense as waves of nuclear missiles devastate much of the globe. The Alliance computer virus is largely ineffective, although it does take out much of the Draco space fleet. In the end, the Draco are victorious and have finally conquered the Earth. Nevertheless, the domination was devastated by the Alliance nuclear arsenal, and the Earth is suffering through a nuclear winter. Thus, the last Alliance outpost, a starship named New America that was secretly being constructed in the asteroid belt, is allowed to leave the solar system, the settled world to be named Samothrace in the Alpha Centauri system. Flash forward to the 25th century, and we find ourselves in the plot of Dracon. The domination has completely eradicated any rebellious attitudes from their service by creating two new human species, the master Draco race, known as Homo Dracanus, and the servile surf race, known as Homo Servus. Using their vastly superior physical strength and speed, along with the pheromones they produce, the Draco are able to truly dominate humanity. They even take their desire for domination to the stars, conquering many alien races and genetically engineering them to be subservient, just like they did for the rest of humanity. The only remaining threat is Samothrace, which continues to push their technological lead over the Draco. I could go on, but since this involves time travel, wormholes, and even the multiverse, I'm finally going to stop here. So is the domination of the Draco plausible? Well, if you couldn't tell by all my snide comments, no it's not. In fact, the Draco remind me of a cliched slasher villain that is inhumanly strong and never gets caught. The kind of slasher who has always helped along in their murder spree thanks to every other character turning their stupidity dial up to 11. Thus, the Draco are the alternate history version of Jason Voorhees. Furthermore, the Draco books are full of so many alternate history cliches, it's hard to keep track of all of them. Nations tend to consolidate into larger states, with very little negative consequences, creating vast space-filling empires. And in case you don't know why that's a problem, go check out the video I did on the subject. The Draco are also a prime example of the evil Afrikaner cliché. Not only would Sterling use it again in the Peshawar Lancers and Conquistador, but even Harry Turtledove would use it in his famous book, The Guns of the South. Parallelism is also rife throughout this timeline's history, with way too many events mirroring what happened in our timeline, despite the massive changes in history that should have prevented them from happening in the first place. Additionally, too many people from our timeline make cameos, despite their births happening long after the initial point of divergence. The Draco's technology level is also completely unbelievable. We are told they are not good at most sciences, but we are showed them being generations ahead of their competitors until they suddenly stall in the last half of the 20th century, when it's just them and the American-led Alliance for Democracy. In the end, the Draco are the traditional definition of an alternate history wink, where a single country is always successful, steadily expands, and generally does way better than is plausible. Thus, there really is no other way to say it. The Draco aren't plausible. But if you remember what I said in part one, I still like these books, and I really do think they're worth a read. Find out why in part three of this plausibility review. Until then, if you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. Bye!